I'm John Drummond and I'm your host for the next 60 minutes. Welcome uh, to the TNT Show and a very good evening to everyone. Uh, thanks to you, the TNT Show and Indie Live are growing and delivering more exciting shows. Now you can watch, for example, the TNT Show on IndieLive.net. It's streamed out to YouTube, to Facebook, to TikTok and Twitter. Plus, on YouTube, you can view all the previous 125 odd shows. How about that? And it doesn't cost you a red cent, not a sou, <laughs> not a nickel, not a dime. It's entirely free. But I want to say this. If you're upset by media coverage of political events where journalism is often junked in favour of stenography uh, and or rehashed news releases, if you're looking for an alternative voice, well, you found it. We're here for you. Now is your chance to be here for us. Please support the crowdfunder. You'll see details on the screen during the course of the programme. It's absolutely vital. Uh, and I would suggest to you this, that if you do look at what you see in the mainstream media and you think, I think could be done better, there could be better balance, there could be a, a, a more extensive range of interviews and interviewees. Well, we're here to provide all of that and so much more. But we, unlike the broadcasters, we, we don't have a tax, there's no poll tax, we can't force you to support us. But we would earnestly ask you, please, to do so. So when you see the crowdfunder details, please, take action. Uh, don't put it off. Say to yourself, I've got to act now. Because if I don't act now, then frankly, I'll be left with no alternative voices. And that's not a good thing for democracy. Well, talking about democracy, this has been another great day for British democracy. Uh, you may recall that the new culture secretary in her maiden speech praised Oliver Cromwell for shipping Scottish prisoners to be slaves in the Caribbean following their capture at the Battle of Dunbar. We like to think that she brings a, a very different view on culture uh, in her new position. Tonight, we're talking to a very special guest. We'll be discussing Brexit, the British Empire, British values, and perhaps a little bit about the abuse of democracy that leads to a new PMP obtaining power on the strength of a mere 0.3% of voters. Tonight, we'll shortly welcome Professor Danny Dorling, and he's taking your questions live, so there's still time to get your question considered. And actually, as it happens, we've already had a question tonight. As you know, the TNT show stands for the Nation Talks, so in many respects, this is your show. As I said, we're live and we're free, so no license, no problem. Now, to our guest tonight, the Nation Talks to Danny Dorling. Thanks for joining us, Danny. How are you? I'm fine. Thanks for having me. And where are you joining us from tonight? Uh, I'm sitting uh, in the middle of Oxford, way down south in England. Lovely, 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 lovely place to be. Uh, well, we've got so much to talk about. Uh, we've had a question already, but if he doesn't mind, I'd like to sort of put that on pause for a moment, but still welcome other questions as they come in. Uh, your book, which I greatly enjoyed, by the way, it, it is called uh, Rule Britannia, Brexit and the End of Empire. What prompted you to write this, Danny? Uh, it was the uh, referendum and, and in particular the referendum result, because the result hadn't been predicted. If you can cast your mind way back uh, to 2015, 2016, there was an enormous amount of polling and lots of spread betting and the spread betting had uh, tended to get general elections quite close so my co-author sally thomason and i and it was sally who persuaded me that we should write this book like many people we were surprised by the result we were shocked uh, a member of parliament was murdered just a few days before the poll so you thought it it was all over and also Sally and I realised that we had dramatically underestimated how important the Brexit poll was. Like many people, we just thought, oh, it's something that's being done for show. Uh, you have the churches, all political parties, the CBI, the trade unions, everybody was for Remain. People were being told what to do, if you like. We just thought it would come and go, and it didn't. And that then required an explanation. Uh, and luckily we had Lord Ashcroft's poll, we knew what people said they did, uh, 
and a huge amount of media commentary. And Sally and I then spent two or three years uh, working on this, trying to get to the bottom of, of what it was and why it was the UK before everywhere else uh, that went for Brexit, that went for leave. And and what were your conclusions? Because I mean, when I read your book, the, the thing that surprised me, Danny, was uh, you turned the conventional um, logic on its head, uh, which was that oh, this was the 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 the, 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 the leave vote was secured on the strength of this red wall of uh, working class voters in the north of England, yeah. uh, and you've proved that's a myth. Yes, um, I mean we recognise that as a myth very very early on. Uh, Lord Ashcroft, who, if you remember, former uh, treasurer of the Conservative Party, very much in the Leave camp, wanted, wanted Britain to leave. He funded an enormous exit poll, which gave us lots of data about who voted and where, the, where they voted and, and how they voted. Uh, I think he funded that exit poll because he, like everybody else, assumed uh, that Leave were going to lose. Not by much. It would be 42. Uh, sorry. 52 uh, remain, 48 leave. And in hindsight, uh, the Leave campaign thought that they would be pushing for a second referendum. So it was all about the build up for the second referendum to try and leave. They thought they had a long campaign on their hands. When you look at certain things that were done in the campaign, certain things that the Leave campaign did, which then got uh, the glare of public scrutiny. Uh, you could conclude that they only did those things because they didn't think there'd be too much attention being paid to them because they weren't going to win the first time. And if you can remember uh, Michael Gove and Boris Johnson's faces the day after the poll, they were in shock. They didn't expect to win. Uh, but we got those results within days of the poll. And within a couple of weeks, I published a paper in the British Medical Journal about who had uh, voted and how they had voted. And the most important, there were two things in, in that paper. First of all, we know from the actual yes and no results by geographical area that more people, a higher proportion of the electorate in the south of England, voted to leave than the proportion of the electorate who voted to leave in the north of England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and Gibraltar. Uh, so it was only ever so slightly, but it was a majority Southern English vote to leave. That is unequivocal. That is from the voting numbers themselves. Secondly, from Lord Ashcroft's poll, we know that the bulk, the majority of leave voters were also middle class. And that wasn't realised at the time. And, and the reasons for this are very, very simple. Middle class people are much more likely to vote than working class people. Uh, and also older people are more likely to vote, and there are more older people in the south of England. Well, we published this within a couple of weeks in the British Medical Journal. In, you might be wondering why on earth did we publish it in a medical journal? I did wonder. And, 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 and the answer was because what the British Medical Journal and all the leading medical journals do is they really check your statistics to make sure you haven't made a mistake or they will not publish your paper. Uh, so I anticipated that people wouldn't believe this. But I, I naively thought, oh, we'll publish it in a medical journal and then it'll just be accepted as a truth and we can progress the debate. <laughs> but really in the event, uh, a different story emerged, a story of it being the Red Wall seats, the north of England. And, and there are two reasons for that. Uh, one is that if you ignore everybody who didn't vote and only look at those who did vote, then you can find some parts of the north which have got a high percentage of voters voting to leave. And secondly, and just as importantly, it was very convenient. The south of England, you know, where all these bodies, the Trade Union Congress, the CBI, all the other business bodies, the, the political parties, the BBC, the churches, I mean, literally every organisation uh, which had quietly said, oh, you need to remain, don't be stupid. They're all Southern English based, uh, and this was this was all a bit embarrassing. We needed to find the scapegoat. Uh, scapegoat. We couldn't blame Scotland for once. <laughs> Scots, Scots hadn't voted to leave. If they had, it'll all be their fault, and we'd be talking about how terrible, and, you know, slow the Scots were. But anyway, but they didn't vote to leave on on average, so we couldn't do that. But we needed somebody to blame for this. It, you know, 
people are now beginning to compare it to the Suez crisis and this kind of moment when Britain slipped down yet again in the international leagues and did something a bit silly. And so that's partly why the story of the red wall seats and the working class uh, rose up and up and up. But the problem is it, it just isn't, it isn't what matters most. What matters most is that a higher proportion of the electorate in the South voted to leave, no matter how you define the South of England, you could draw the line in many ways, still true, and a higher proportion of middle class people, uh, social class ABC1, made, made up the bulk of the Leave voters. And it was old, it was older people as well. Uh, and that's you know, particularly important. The turnout was low amongst the old, the over 65s. So that was high, sorry. And the Leave voting was high. And that's all it took. There was a lot of complacency. But uh, the other thing I, I should say that was crossing Sally Tomlinson's and my mind as we were writing this book was that we didn't see the kind of normal reversal you get when you have these kind of referendums elsewhere in Europe. The normal thing is you tell people they can have a choice, you steer them to the choice they're allowed to have, and if by mistake they somehow choose the choice they weren't supposed to choose, you then find some mechanism. You know, it was only an advisory poll. Uh, you find some mechanism to it to ignore what they've done. Uh, and the second really surprising thing about Brexit was that Parliament uh, was unable, the House of Lords, who were heavily for Remain, were unable to find a compromise, some way uh, of reversing this uh, so that it didn't happen. And that, that showed just how determined those who wanted to leave those with power, those with money, those who back this, not, not voters, um, were. The, the other thing I think worth saying, you know, we have a really weird parliamentary system in this country. We, around about 1918, we chose not to have a fair voting system. Most of Europe did, you know, most of Europe has in the world. You know, you, if you vote, your vote counts. People could argue about how it counts, but it counts. Now, now we are a strange country, you know, only us and Iran have members of the established church in our parliament. You know, there's very few countries in the world that have an unelected, unelected house. Isn't it, isn't but it, the first post voting, the first past the post voting in Westminster means that nine out of ten people have a vote that's almost worthless. The chance yeah. of influencing a seat is tiny. And so this referendum, for those of, of whom were young enough that this was the first serious one they'd voted in. It's the first time in their life they'd ever got the chance to actually actually complain in a way that might matter. And many people, you know, I suspect they voted to leave not thinking that everybody else, enough people would vote to leave. But, you know, they were annoyed. Yeah. It's, it's interesting you mentioned the House of Lords there because it, isn't it, I mean, I know that Iran and I think the Vatican also allow people who are clergymen to make laws, but but uh, but I think what's different about the House of Lords is that there are people there, not simply based on which bed they were born in, but their anatomical features, i.e. the primogenitor system uh, excludes women. So it's not only, it's not, it's not, it's not only hereditary. It's actually biased against half the population. And you think, yeah. how can that possibly be sustained in this in the 21st century? It's extraordinary. Oh, and it is a clue. These things are, cl are all clues to, you know, why did we vote to leave? We were, in many ways, and we are, a very odd state. Um, you know, quite an unusual state in Europe. We, You know, by the time of the referendum, we had become the second most unequal country economically in, in the whole of Europe. I think it was 2007 or 2009 when we'd over, overcome Portugal to become the most unequal country in Western Europe. That was under New Labour. You know, quite New Labour, we've talked about, you know, reducing child poverty and so on. Which, you know, they, they managed to tip a million children from one side of a poverty line just over to the other side. But at the same time, because they weren't worrying about the, the rich as long as they paid their taxes. Inequalities grew and grew and grew. And so we became, in terms of everyday life, the most unequal country and the one with the weirdest uh, voting system. And and when we look back at it, 
you know, one of the most unusual histories. It's, you're suddenly left with this problem. You know, after we left, well, we didn't finally leave until January 2020, but, you know, you had to explain, well, why didn't anywhere else in Europe leave first? I mean, it's obvious now why they're not going to leave. You know, no idiot would, you know, when you can see what actually happens if you try to leave this because, you know, you recreate a border. Greece has a border with well, Bulgaria. You can't, you can't leave. So it became imperative to try to understand why it was this large state in the EU of the 28 that, that left. And the only guide we had was Greenland. I mean, Greenland had left the European community years before, but they had a really good deal because um, they had fish. This is the, the trick. They had something to trade. And so they made a deal with the European community that, that people from Greenland uh, could still go to Denmark, have Danish citizenship and move around the EU just as much as they like. Uh, and for the fish quotas, they got some money. So, you know, that, that kind of made sense. And Greenland's a long way away from Europe. Um, but it's, you know, it is interesting. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. For a start, it helped save any other EU country from thinking of leaving and help them realise the repercussions of doing so. But it may also have accelerated the realisation within Britain of what kind of place we really are, what we tell ourselves, what we believe, and how true that is. Whereas if we had stayed in the European Union, we'd have carried on having an unfair deal where we didn't pay our fair share, we'd have carried on staying out of the euro and thinking that our special currency was ever so ever so special uh, and we'd have carried on pushing things in europe uh, in a way that weren't necessarily beneficial to most people in europe uh, i mean most obviously by the time we left we were supplying 40 far-right members of the european parliament that that by far right i mean they belong to groups to the right of the European People's Party, the, the European Conservatives. In 2014, our Conservative Party left the European Conservative bloc and aligned itself with Alternative for Deutschland and their friends. So on leaving, immediately the European Parliament lost its biggest groups of far-right <laughs> MEPs. And they now have to lie on Poland with less than two dozen uh, as, as the kind of bulwark of, of the far-right uh, in the EU. So, so it's not all bad news for Europe, but it may not all be bad news for Britain either. Yeah. Well, we, we come on to that in a second, perhaps. You make an interesting connection between the sort of attitudes that produce Brexit and the end of the British Empire. Mm. What, what, what connections do you draw there? Oh, there were two reasons. We, we came to this slowly. I mean, it took us a long time to write this book. We, we, we all almost had a deal with one publisher. That's why, that's why we wrote it. And then at the last minute, that publisher got a better offer, I think, from the from the civil service. If you remember that Gordon Brown once threw a stapler at somebody. Yeah. Right, the person who he threw the stapler at uh, and a colleague of his was writing a book on Brexit. So suddenly mine and Sally's book wasn't of interest to our publisher anymore. Um, and then we had to hunt round for, for a publisher. And no publisher wanted to publish a book on Brexit because there were so many dozens and dozens of books on Brexit. And ironically, we ended up with one last publisher, which was Biteback. And the interesting thing about Biteback is they're owned by Lord Ashcroft. <laughs> uh, and the wonderful thing about, about that for us is, is that we were, we were careful, we we're very polite, but we didn't have to worry too much about what we said about Lord Ashcroft, given that he was publishing the book, he could hardly sue himself. But we were still polite, polite to Lord Ashcroft. Um, but he was a link to why we began to think of empire, uh, because his background, his his father was, I think, in a colonial service or elsewhere, kind of engaged in what was left of the empire. He'd been grown up in a household in a former colony uh, with servants and so on. And then we began to look at more and more of the people who were funding the Brexit campaign, and disproportionately we found that so many of them had connections to the kind of great points of, of empire. And then we began to look at the newspaper journalists that we were quoting. When we, when we read things, we thought, oh, this is particularly insightful. And we, we put the quotes into the book. 
And we noticed that almost all the quotes, and this was accidental, we were not trying to be right on or anything, but almost all the quotes we were right, we were putting in were written by journalists whose parents or grandparents had migrated here who were Asian or black and had been f former colonial subjects of the British Empire. And they had a particular eye on what was going on that appeared to be acute and appeared to be right. So it was that mixture of the white men who were the sons of colonial officers pushing for it and the black and Asian men and women writing in our newspapers say, saying how silly and weird a lot of this was. And, and that's what got Sally and I going on the legacy of empire and thinking, could that, could the fact that Britain had had the largest empire the world has ever known, and we've never quite accepted it as gone, you know, we have chance, two world wars and one world cup and so on. Um, could that be part of the reason for why there was such a lobby for this? Why was it such a thing for the Conservative Party for so many years? You know, why did John Major get those knives in his back? Why did George Osborne in 2015, who was against Brexit and then said, whatever you do, don't have a referendum. Why did George Osborne promise to make Britain the richest country, large country in the world, GDP per capita, by the year 2030? Why did every British Chancellor, including the current one, carry on this ridiculous promise that if you just trust them within a few years, we'll be number one. Um, what on earth is it that makes certain particularly English people so gung-ho? And then you think, oh, where's the word gung-ho come from? Where? <laughs> yeah. uh, and then, then what Sally and I did, particularly Sally, is, is we look back through the old school textbooks, that, the schools that these people went to, what they were taught. And of course, the textbooks talk about how miraculous and brilliant the empire was. And then more recently, you know, when our current prime minister, when he was campaigning, I think it was the first time, did he even have to campaign the second time? He did first for the, first, the first time he was campaigning to be prime minister. And he said, nobody should vilify the history of the British Empire. This is only last year. Um, because, you know, this, this is Rishi Sunak saying uh, there's nothing ever happened under the empire that, that, that should be criticised. There should be no vilification of it. Or even more recently, Jeremy Hunt, our Chancellor, saying in his autumn statement, and he said it with gusto and looked out across the Commons when he said it, so he clearly written the words himself, said the British Empire has always been a moral force for good. <laughs> no, no. Not saying it was all wrong, and you know, if it hadn't been the British Empire, there would have been another European Empire just as big. But it really is under their skin, isn't it? And it still is. And these men, these men are now younger than me. I mean, I'm getting, you know, I'm the age of Gove and Johnson and that lot. They were they were all trashing my home city when I was growing up here. Um, but watching watching people younger than me talking about this empire and nostalgic thing is a bit eerie. It's a bit a bit strange. Uh, is it your view this is coming? through the, in part at least, through the public school system, the type of material that's used there, and the fact that there's such a sort of almost insular grouping of people, they all know each other, they promote uh, each yeah. other, they like each other. How, how does it carry on? Um, it was certainly the dominant ethos uh, during the teenage years of these politicians. And you've got to remember about their friendship groups. I mean, these these were teenagers, the older ones at least, when Margaret Thatcher was prime minister. And they were teenagers who liked Margaret Thatcher, which was a very rare thing for teenagers at that time to do. And of course, they didn't mix. They all think they mix. It's, the British are amazing for how much they think they socially mix. Um, but it just shows how much they spot the very slight differences between people that they think they've mixed when they met somebody ever so slightly poor than them. But they're, they're, in, they're in a grouping where the triumphant history is told. And of course, their schools are built on the back of this, literally the bricks and the mortar of, of the schools. The Dollar Academy up in, up in Scotland, where Fraser Nelson, I think, studied. Mm. You know, if you look at, look at where the money for that came from, it's not a pretty sight. 
the school books uh, were chosen by teachers who know what the parents expect their children to be taught. I mean, you don't pay a lot of money for your children. Well, there are a couple of, of weird private schools where you do, but in general, you don't pay a lot of money for your children to be taught that there's something different about the history of their country and perhaps the people who made a lot of money weren't all great because you wanted the people who made a lot of money. Um, and then it's self-reinforcing. Uh, you head off to university. Apart from Nick Clegg, it's all to one university. The leadership contests, uh, when it was Hunt and Johnson, it was the two senior Oxford men against each other. It's still the Oxford men who are in charge. Occasionally you allow an Oxford woman through, Theresa May, Margaret Thatcher. In those circles, at the, that university, you will spend most of your time with your like-minded friends. And then at age 21, you head off to London and to the West London dinner parties. And you can reinforce even more what it was that you were taught and taught by your school tutors and taught by your tutor at university. And then you hear people like me and you, and you think, oh, this is terrible. He doesn't have a clue about our wonderful imperial past. How on earth could they have made him a professor of a university when he doesn't know what a great thing the British Empire was? And so, you know, the doubt doesn't creep in. Uh, and, and one of the misconceptions is about the whole business of free trade. I know it's the apostles of free trade, but the reality is when we look that the British Empire was not founded at all on free trade purpose. No, no, we, we forced a trade. We had gunboats to make people trade with us when they didn't want to. Palmerston. I know, and then we're, you know, Gladstone said how awful Palmerston was. We sent the gunboats to Hong Kong to insist that the Chinese buy the opium they didn't want to buy that we were growing in our colonies. We destroyed China. A hundred wasted years. Every school child in China is taught about the opium wars in detail. I've yet to meet a child in Britain. You know, somebody may tell me, oh, in this module in the history curriculum, we finally put it into a part of A-level marked very dangerous, don't mention. You know, <laughs> we teach them about the abolition of the slave trade. We don't say very much about who built it up to be so big or benefited from it, but, you know, we're very proud about the abolition. I mean, uh, it's, but the forced it's... trading of drugs, no, no, we don't. And so much, and we have some in the book. Uh, I mean, it's just, it just seems to me to be incredible that, you know, I, I think there were, at one point the East India Company was, well, they, they were they were producing tea and then forcing the Chinese, the, they, were, yeah, they wanted to ship tea, but they forced the, the Chinese to consume vast amounts of, of, of opium yeah. uh, to get tea cheaply. So, they, I, I mean, it just sounds horrendous. I mean... Oh, we, we destroyed the textile industry of India. Um, but, but like I say, if it hadn't been Britain, it would have almost certainly been another European country. So, so I, I'm not in the business of saying how terrible this was. It, 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 it was terrible, uh, most of it. And it's not easy to talk about the benefits and say, oh, look, this railroad made all the difference or you know, look, this country has got our legacy of this, so it does so much better than China. And you go, oh, no, actually, China's doing rather better, isn't it, in terms of infant mortality and so on. Uh, but I'm, I'm not into, I don't think there's a need. I think there's, there's such a global swell of people explaining our world history uh, that there's no need for that. In fact, there may even be more of a need of explaining if it hadn't been Scotland and England leading this, it would have been Portugal, Spain, possibly the Dutch, Amsterdam, possibly yeah. even the Swedes, you know. Um, there, but a bit of an accident of fate and geography and seaports could be somewhere else. But we are going to have to, at some point, you know, we can't be Wakanda and cut ourselves off, you know, as some kind of a state that doesn't see what the rest of the world is doing. At some point, we are going to have to look at the world history that the rest of the world teaches its children about what really happened. And at various times, this is acknowledged. I think it's Gordon Brown uh, who said in one UN speech that we walked in uninvited, invaded or conquered 90% uh, of the current members of the United Nations. 
Uh, I've written a lot of books about population growth and change and the global population explosion from 1 billion to 2 billion to 4 to 8, uh, which is now slowing down. But the beginning of that population explosion was the enclosure of lands in Britain, clearing of the highlands and so on, and then the requisitioning of lands all around the world and the destroying of thousands of relatively stable social systems that had learned how to control population. You know, the most devastating in Australia, the longest uh, lived civilizations in, in human history. But everywhere we went, we destroyed the systems that had been in place and baby booms began. Um, and it, if it hadn't been us, it would have been somebody else. But it was us. And, and you know, we, we don't need to feel ashamed. This is our great grandparents, great great grandparents. But we do need to know you, you can't operate in an alternative reality where this never happened or it was all wonderful. But, but it, it, you, you point out it's even more um, interlinked than that in the sense that, okay, you, you need to acknowledge the, the pluses and the minuses. Uh, mm. uh, and that's uh, certainly the, the, the books I read when I was at school didn't at all reflect that. Uh, the, the, every missionary was painted as somebody who went out there to civilise uncivilized yeah. people yeah uh, they're all civilized it's curiously the whole world was uncivilized there was only one group that wasn't uncivilized and that was us uh, yeah. it was our duty it was the white man's burden to go out there and do all these uh, very uh, important things uh, and nobody mentioned trade certainly nobody mentioned vessel roads. Uh, nobody talked about what happened in india nobody talked about the east india company i mean it, just, it went on and on but it struck yeah. me too that uh, if you if you get into that narrative, it, it blinds you from the fact that the trade if the trade wasn't free, then you're harking back to a, a state that didn't ever exist. Yeah. And therefore, if you apply that logic now, which is what seems to be happening, in other words, Brexit will allow us to trade freely with the whole yes. world. We, yes. we will have global Britain and it will be free of these nasty Europeans who've been holding us back dreadfully mm. all these years and conning us at every stage with the straight bananas, the bent bananas, goodness knows what else. And this mm. huge bureaucracy, we'll get rid of it in one fell swoop and we'll go back to those halcyon days of free trading. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're very right. And that's, we have a section in the book about Ricardo and th these economic theories that, that people on the right tend to love. Um, that trade is ever so efficient. I think it was wine from Portugal and wool from England. And the idea was because we can make wool more efficiently, we'll do the sheep and they'll do the wine and we'll trade and, and we'll all be better off for it. And we noticed that the Chancellor of the Exchequer sits on a thing called the wool sack. And the wool in the wool sack comes from over 50 countries. So <laughs> you produce wool everywhere. You don't necessarily have this specialization. You know, of course, wine grows better in certain places than, than others, but it just does. Um, it's not something you're going to affect or could change that quickly. A little bit of global warming helps a bit with growing wine in the UK, but we still couldn't suddenly become better. Uh, and we forced we forced people to trade with us in, in numerous subtle ways. It, it was most obvious when we lost the empire, which I remember is very, very recently. Yeah. You know, that, that I mean, the Queen kind of began uh, as an empress. Victoria was certainly an empress. Uh, the last colonies went in the 60s and the 70s, Hong Kong, and not until 1997. We still have Gibraltar. Uh, when we lost those last colonies in the, in the 60s, early 70s, it was a matter of a few years before our industry collapsed because we couldn't coerce people to buy our goods anymore. And, you, you know, you'll remember 1977, 76, the shipyards that started up mm. Ravens Craig and then up on the Clyde and then the Tyne, and it swept down you know, this wave of unemployment. Um, car industry decimated again and again because, and it was worse for us than other European countries because we had had established more unfair systems which meant that the deindustrialization was was worst uh, for us. But 
because I mean, you, you make, you make that, 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 that really eloquent point in chapter six. You say things fall apart, empire crumble. Uh, most severely at the heart of the former empire in the imperial capital city and then across the home country. Uh, and then you go on to say, it's always been this way and yet we rarely try to learn much from the fate of past empires. Yeah. Uh, and you point out this time, uh, we think things are different. They are not. This time we are told that we will rebuild the empire. We will not. Things fall apart. It's just a stage that the British are going to have to get through. Yeah, I don't see any evidence of that happening. I mean, I look around and I see the same vainglorious nonsense that we refer to in the history books. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, I'll give an example of what I mean. Um, Keir Starmer said recently that the Labour Party's approach is to, and I quote him directly here, to make Brexit work. If you were in charge of Brexit, how would you make it work, Danny? <laughs> I would, yes, I, I wouldn't say that. I'd find another form of words, but you've got to find a, a form of words which doesn't insult the majority of voters who did vote to leave. You've got to uh, understand their very real concerns. I mean, we're now living in the UK, as Stephanie Flanders said said last week, and the stats show this, where the poorest fifth of people are poorer than the poorest fifth in most of Eastern Europe. Um, so it's a very tricky uh, situation it, for a politician to, to handle and, and describe. Well, it, it, it might or might not be. I mean, for example, it'd be perfectly reasonable for somebody who was concerned about the poor to say, I'm not having this, not in my country. If I'm the leader, I will not have poor people treated this way. It's immoral, yes. it's obscene, and I will not have it. Uh, it, it, it sounds, yeah. But when you cut and trim like this, i.e. to say, look, you know, uh, I'm going to make Brexit work when you, when you deep down you know it can't work. Yeah. You, 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 it, you, it seems to me that that's the difference between a politician and a statesman. <laughs> a statesman would say, let's 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 be honest here and, and give people a direction, even though it might not appeal to everyone. It, it's yeah. it's the right direction. I mean, you make, make the point in the book. You say we will make a prophecy here. They do not yet know it, but what the Brexiteers have actually sped us towards is the final whimper of the old ideal of the British Empire. Yeah. Now, if I heard Keith Stammer say that, it would help to ameliorate making Brexit work for me. I would, I would think, hey, this guy understands. Yes. I don't yeah, get the right. sense, Danny. You know? that, there isn't much there with Keir, but if you look, Lisa Nandy published a book a few weeks ago. And if you remember, Lisa Nandy was up against Keir for the leadership. Yeah. And in the middle of her book, comfortably hidden the many pages in she has a go at people taking knighthoods uh and of uh calling our honors after the british empire now she was close to being labor leader she's not that radical but i um i'm a glass half full person so i look out for these sort of signs okay signs of changes but but if you're being you know former empires the, the nearest one in time is the soviet union which collapsed and clearly Moscow and Russia are not accepting the collapse of, of the of that empire very well at the moment and uh, they had an absolutely disastrous pandemic life expectancy fell by four years so only one year that was COVID the other three was social disaster and services falling apart because of the pandemic um, you can go back to the Ottoman Empire they're not trying to recreate the Ottoman Empire now you do learn you can you can look at the Dutch, United Provinces, you know, the, the Dutch, they have echoes of imperialism. Amsterdam was the richest place in Europe, but it's so long ago they've kind of let it go. You can look at the Swedes who had an empire. Now, they're still a little bit more empire-like than the Norwegians and Finns on either side of them. And I would say that's partly a legacy of having had an empire, but it all eventually goes. It will go from Britain. But it might be my grandchildren or great grandchildren's time uh, that you know the Italians don't go on about the Roman Empire, Emperor. Well, a little bit, but not about recreating well, not it. Much. Yes. Um, well, I feel this. Italy is a fairly recent construct in, in broad yeah. terms. You know, I, I guess you could say. 
Yes, but, but 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 also, but you know, people in Greece are very very aware of the tenuous connection between ancient Greece and and the Greece that there is now. You know, very proud of of, of what's left and so on. Yeah, but that yeah, was I, also an empire empire creation because when we were writing our our history books, just as our empire was growing, we had to find somewhere in Europe to talk about being the origin place, and because because Europe was so backwards in world history, you know this cold north west edge of asia we weren't the continent um because we were such a backwater the nearest place they could find was athens which was only just in europe you know to talk about where civilization began you know thank god we had athens you know otherwise we might have had to pick somewhere <laughs> somewhere further but you know athens and rome very very near the edge of europe yeah yeah interesting you mentioned lisa nandy there she's such a has, I'm afraid, said some very unkind things about Scotland, which uh, mm. uh, I hope she'll get a chance to address at some early stage. Um, yeah, the, the lady she, Harvey doesn't know what to do about Scotland. Well, that's very clear. That's yeah. very clear. And uh, it, it, it's, it's a, a concern. I mean, um, obviously, any new leader would want to form associations or alliances or connections with whoever keeps them in power. But then Keir Stammer has said, I will have no truck with the SNP, which strikes me as a rather bizarre thing to say, but because uh, I would have thought that you would want to reverse all the problems that this present government has left and presumably will create even more before it's before it goes. You would think you would jump at any chance to, to fix that uh, because the alternative would be to let the present government continue. That, strikes me as bizarre why you would want to do that oh there are other bizarre things so you know if you're looking well often we look to other countries in europe when you're looking for progressive social policies and what should mm. we do and right of course europe you can find out now how housing is well organized in vienna or how schools are well organized and you know there's, there's always a good example somewhere in europe but yeah. in the uk increasingly it's scotland it's yeah. if you want to know how do you not expel children from schools permanently you look to Scotland, where it's five a year, as opposed yeah. to the thousands in England. You know, if you want to know about, about doing something about rents in a time of crisis, you'll know this. Uh, child benefit yeah. and poverty. All, you know, all the best examples of progressive social policy in Britain uh, have for years now been in Scotland. And so many outcomes, but now we measure them. Uh, yeah. And so it's for, for Britain's supposedly progressive left-wing party, it is, you know, and you can see the strength of, of the union there and the strength of the empire legacy in the fact that the, the progressive social democratic party of England cannot see beyond the jingoism at the social progress, let alone working ahead. You know, the, the last time that the third party in British politics was a national party was 1918 when it was Sinn Féin. Sinn Féin, yeah. Yeah, and immediately after then, oh, there, there was a... Yeah, then we split. Um, but there's a lack of imagination that they just, it's toxic. They don't know what to do, how to talk. Yeah, you know, the level of diplomacy that you just require inside, inside a country. If the SNP were doing nasty things, you know, if they were taking money away from poor children, if the SNP were arguing to increase rents when the cost of living is going up, you know, I, I could understand it then, but 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 it's the other way around. Uh, so it really exposes this kind of imperial past. You mustn't question the sanctity of the union, um, and you know other countries have this as well, of as, of course. But but the fact that it's riven all the way through the English establishment, uh, I think, is is a little bit odd. It, is that? I mean. It seems slightly. I mean, you can understand it in the Conservative Party because, as we discussed, they, these folks grow up together. They go to the same clubs. I mm. mean, we've been watching uh, Richard Sharp go through some <laughs> traumatic times recently <laughs> in front of the committee, the Culture Committee, trying to explain that uh, he can introduce people to the Prime Minister, uh, and he knows the Prime Minister is short of money, uh, and he knows this person has the money, mm. but he, he's just. He's just a pal, you know. The fact that he became head of the BBC was entirely coincidental. 
and nothing to do with this. And you think, this is a grown man, mm. and he's sitting in front of me giving this fairy story, and, and he expects people to believe it. If it was any other country in the world, they would say, this is nonsense. You must understand this is nonsense. And well, yet, well, it, it varies. There's a continuum. Uh, I wrote a book with a Finnish colleague on Finland, and the thing which most shocked me about Finland is that government ministers immediately resign on the minute that somebody points out that they've done the tiniest indiscretion. It's it's shocking. And I think there's a continuum from how they behave in Finland through to kind of worse behaviour as you head to the extreme of Europe, you know, in Italy and so on, mm. uh, to us having the very worst, you know, yeah. by far by now. Um, yeah. Partygate, we know we actually we got some, we we are number one <laughs> in this in Europe, but but you know Trump Trump managed to beat us as you know always, you know as yet, no Conservative leader has arranged for an insurrection on January the sixth to to occur. Although we we don't know, you know Parliament <laughs> meeting slightly <laughs> illegally exactly yeah so uh, and uh, managed to involve the, the monarch in it as well. Yeah. Uh, so I mean. It, you know, you would think on the face of it, looking at this all this moral turpitude mm -hmm. and corruption, that it would behove the leader of the opposition to stand up and be, as it were, some sort of beacon of morality and saying, look, up, up with this, we will not put, we, we are not going to behave this way. Uh, mm -hmm. We will judge people on their merits uh, and, uh, and we will promote on, on that basis too. And anyone who steps out of line will be summarily dismissed, as they do in Finland. Mm. But there's none of that. There's none of that. It's it all seems to be tacking and responding to the headline, and then moving into. And you think, oh, God, and we've had so many people on the show who've said, "You have to understand this, John. That's not how these folks think. They're just doing that in order to get elected. Once they've been elected, yeah. it'd be very different." And I think no, 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 they, they, yeah, they can change and. Um, and there has been up and downs in, in, in recent British history. Um, so it's not all legacy of empire. I mean, and Iron Bevan is, is my favourite example of a, a minister with a moral purpose. Yeah. Um, but he created the, the health service with the help of a now forgotten Conservative Minister of Health who pushed it. Uh, and all the political parties became more moral in the 1920s and 1930s as we became more equal, as the wealth of the empire was going, we, we were, did try and do a different thing. The great achievement of the 45 government wasn't what it did during those few years, 45 to 50. It was what came after. You can judge governments by what comes after them. Uh, and those 20 years after the 45 governments, you had, you had the Conservatives competing for could they build more high quality council houses. And, and the complaint was that the council houses they were building weren't of good enough quality. Yeah, it's still very, you know, that was the world we were in. This yeah. 1964 government, again, uh, you can judge it for what came afterwards. We, we had the lowest income inequalities, highest rise in life expectancy, all kinds of comprehensive schools, going to school with other people living in your area. Happens in the rest of Europe. It was quite new for us. Um, and then, you know, if you want to go backwards, the Callaghan government, uh, 74 to 79, if you judge it by what came after it, it was truly atrocious. Hmm. And again, if you judge the 97 to 2010 government, not just on what they did, but what came after them, then it's a real failure. So the whole lot shifts to being more Machiavellian, less principled, all our political parties, uh, and this happens in other countries as well. In Finland, all the parties are more progressive. Uh, I met a conservative mayor in Helsinki who was to the left of, of Jeremy Corbyn, other than he liked conscription, but on all his other social policies. Merkel in Germany. Merkel's policies, the German conservatives, were to the left of Jeremy Corbyn. Merkel spent, spends a hard portion of money on public services than, than Labour promised to in 2017 or 2019. Merkel let in far more refugees. So we've gone the other way. In, in, in Britain in general, our political parties since the 70s all tacked towards becoming less and less and less progressive. So they like each other.
And then, and that spurs on what happens in Scotland and how voting in Northern Ireland is a bit different because of the repugnance of watching Westminster moving to the far right of, of European politics. Bearing that in mind uh, and picking up on some of the questions from Charles Smith and others, what would you suggest to uh, politicians in Scotland who want to bring about constitutional change when they see what you've just described? They say, OK, uh, we prefer not to be an immediate part of that. We'd like to plough our own furrow and perhaps uh, create some uh, different uh, twin sovereign arrangement of some kind, let's say. Uh, what advice would you give to them? It's a long game. Uh, that's the, the really important thing. And it's a really long game. And it's a long game even if you are very successful in the very short term. In, in uh, creating a successful, progressive Northern European country takes three generations. So it's patience. It's all about... It, you know, eat, even if things were to happen very fast for those people who want independence, it's still a long game. And if it doesn't happen fast, it's still a long game. It is incredibly rare nowadays for, for new countries to form or for regions to get an autonomy similar uh, to being a country. And then having said that, uh, elections really do matter. At some point, we're likely to get an election where Scotland will hold the balance of power and it's planning for that and making key decisions about that that, that matter uh, for the whole of the uk we need to think about our undemocratic electoral system so you would expect the liberals to be less wishy-washy uh in england and actually simply demand as a part of any coalition that they enter that pr is instigated as a result of them entering that coalition now what the snp would demand would be interesting but you decide it and you have quiet talks in the years two years before it so it's not a hell of a shock and you don't have the cabinet secretary uh, as happened in 2010 can you remember 2010 the cabinet secretary told the leaders of the main parties they had the weekend to come to an agreement and that's how we got the liberal conservative coalition now the weekend otherwise the pound will crash on monday right so 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 you know talks early talks quiet talks now and also the talking early quiet and in private now would hopefully help reduce the more stupid the acidic comments that are sometimes made in public that are simply not helpful and won't even get the politicians who say them many votes anyway uh yeah, it's, I mean, that's it, the kind of that's the kind of advice i have yeah i mean it, it, it seems to me you make a perfectly reasonable point the, the, the challenge, I suppose, and it's the one that Nicola Sturgeon will need to handle somehow, is that having built up a momentum yeah. which produced a referendum already uh, and being in power for, I mean, the SNP are way ahead in opinion polls. Yeah. Uh, and their, their biggest uh, deficit, if I can call it that, is that they want to push even more progressive policies like the gender recognition Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, uh, and the approach from Westminster is to say no, we 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 don't want to deal with you. I mean, Westminster ministers don't speak to their Scottish counterparts, yeah, except on very rare occasions. Uh, uh, and I can't really see that changing because I can't see any incentive to change it. Because why should you care? I mean, strictly speaking, uh, yeah. you you would have to have a sense of not of empire but of uh, a wish for certain progressive policies and that's absent so that so there's there's no oh, yeah. need to, yeah to, there's to, only to well, yeah. yeah while you have a conservative majority in the house of commons you have no chance whatsoever uh, and no recognition it doesn't matter how clear the case would, would be made or you know, the UN could step in and say we recognise a separate country, right? No, you know, and that, that's part of an empire legacy. You know, we don't recognise people just wanting their own stuff. Of course, we don't. We wouldn't have painted all the world pink if we did that. So, so no, no, they haven't got a chance in hell. While you have a conservative majority, it's it's 
when there's when there is a balance the, ch the chances even on labor's highest polling of labor actually having a large working majority are pretty low yeah um so so you've got to play uh and plan and plan and and work for what is the agreement and not leave it to the last minute to wait for the result to then start talking yeah uh, i was looking at nicola's age the other day uh, and i um i thought oh um, looks like a game plan for when she's 65 does this to me you know <laughs> slow and steady the gender recognition about certain things but it it also helps solidify your power within the party in scotland of those who are loyal to you and those who are not for the longer fight to to possibly come um you know you, you need impatience but but this is a this is a rare occurrence um you know if if i was in scotland and i wanted independence i would be very happy to see it occur in my last few years of life. I would I would put that as a major achievement of what I had worked for by stepping back and, and looking uh, at, at things. And there are events you cannot predict. This you is know, true. A, a, a sterling crisis. Yeah. What happens when this supposedly such brilliant currency, you know, is knocked and somebody decides to gamble with it and play games? Yeah. and see and see you know how so how strong is the bank of england then when does yeah. that happen the housing market four or five months of falls massive falls if you take into account inflation um that's where most of our wealth is that you know we should know with covid brexit the crash of 2008 there's been so many crises that yeah, there, there will be more to come yeah. uh so so it's you know we're so not it's, it's a bit, it's, it sounds a bit like lenin's uh, remarks yes. that, that for many decades nothing happens and all of a sudden lots yeah. of decades happen very shortly <laughs> a, a, a lot happens i mean the other interesting thing which yeah, i think i don't know maybe people in scotland do talk about this more uh, is a bit yeah how can this argument be used to help england understand where it is and what it is it that, is doing I, that's that's what uh, I, i'm thinking about writing a piece of my column called mega yeah. which stands for Make England Great Again. Because uh, yeah. yeah. uh, I feel that Scottish independence could be, you know, something that helped that process. But that process needs to take place anyway. There's been lots of debate in Scotland about how progressive one wants to be as, as a government, as a, as a country. That debate seems to me needs to take place in England. Yes, but, you, but you know, you've got to look at the state. You remember we had a referendum about some devolution for the northeast of England where, yeah. where one Dominic Cummings uh, was on the, on the group that helped to ensure that people didn't even vote for that. And since then, you know, the northeast has been the region that has fallen the most. It is the, it's even even further. Um, it, but it does seem to me, when I, certainly when I watch Westminster, I get the impression I'm looking back in time to discussions that took place in Scotland 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. It, it, it seems primitive to me when I when I watch what's happening. It's not so much that there's a swing to the right, it's the fact that nobody wants to talk about England. Yeah. Everyone wants to talk about something else. And until you actually sit down and say, no, folks, we need to talk about what, we need to decide what we stand for and what we do not stand for. Yeah. And that, Debate took place in Scotland. It took place over a couple of three decades. Uh, and when I, I look at Westminster, I don't see. It, it seems to be that's missing. There's mm -hmm. a there's a vacuum. It's hollowed out, as it were. Yeah. And something needs to fill it. Yeah, yeah and, and it's still very much governed from the south. Yeah, you know, yeah. and the leader of the opposition, he went to Oxford. The Shadow Chancellor, she, she's from. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's it's it's. And of course, all those young conservatives who were, who were put into seats they weren't supposed to win in 2019, <laughs> partly because possibly they might be a bit of a liability. You know, they're largely not at all from those pet places. So, so you we've stuffed the Commons with even more Southerners, yeah, um, who've got an interest in London and their own careers. Well, that, uh, that's a good, very good point. We've run out of time. I, I did say at the beginning we wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. We wouldn't be able to get as much in as we wanted. This has been fantastic. I, I really appreciate it.
and uh, maybe if you're free, you could come back uh, maybe later on in the year. I'd love to. It's it's, lo it's lovely to chat. Thank you for having me on. I feel we've only scratched the surface, frankly, yeah. but there we go. Thanks again, Dan. If you can stick around for a few minutes after we go off air, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let, let me just uh, let me just sum up. A big thank you to Danny and a big thank you to all of you for joining us. Uh, as you know, we've got some really uh, super guests continuing in the years, uh, weeks ahead. Look out for Judith Reid from the Chain of Freedom Across Scotland next week. Uh, and do look out for my column in the Sunday National this weekend. You'll find it in the seven day supplement. I'll be looking more closely at the BBC uh, to ask whether it serves the nation's interests. And one question I want to tackle on Sunday is, will the BBC head, Richard Sharp, resign if the inquiry into his application and appointment as BBC chair criticize, criticizes him for withholding key information about the huge loan he facilitated for Boris Johnson? Uh, right now he won't say, um, but we gather from uh, his remarks in the Commons Committee that he has news of a peerage that Johnson has organised for uh, the Daily Mail's Paul Dacre. There you are. If you think things have gotten bad, they just got a lot worse. <laughs> to all of you, thanks for joining us. Stay safe, take care, and head please straight for the crowdfunder and help out Indie Lives. Many thanks. See you all next week.